Turn, please, in your Bibles to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. A current fascination, in the United States at least, is ancestry. The second most popular type of internet search has to do with ancestry. People by the millions are having DNA tests to try to determine what their ancestry might be. What percentage Irish am I? What percentage whatever else am I? 2018, there were 12 million such tests, and the number has grown almost exponentially since then. I was kind of interested in ancestry and was able to trace mine back somewhat. I used to think it was Scandinavian, Pole Sun, seemed like a really Swedish kind of name, but actually I found out it's, uh, my ancestry is from Scotland. And uh, so, having been to Scotland three or four times, I assumed that I was going to have a natural affinity towards Scotland, and that as soon as I got there, there would be some deep primeval pulling of my soul toward all things Scots because of my DNA. Well, I liked Scotland, I thought it was beautiful, uh, didn't care for some of the food, was not even going to go near haggis. Uh, if you don't know what haggis is, Google it and uh, do it before you eat. Uh, make sure that you uh, have not just had a fresh meal before you uh, Google got haggis for those of the uh, more sensitive among you. So I go to Scotland and uh, I liked it. I enjoyed it. Found out that my ancestry is of the Mackay clan, Mackay. Uh, Polson is a sept of the Mackay clan, so I legitimately could come up here and wear a Mackay kilt. I could go to the kilt shop and have one made for about $3,000, and uh, who knows, maybe next Sunday I'll show up in a kilt and uh, you will decide whether I need to continue as your pastor, I suppose. And the United States is, of course, a nation of mutts. We have ancestry from all kinds of places, do we not? But when you stop and think about it spiritually, there is only two strains of DNA to be found in this room and around the world. Spiritually speaking, in terms of DNA, you are either a child of God or you are a child of the devil. That's it. No other ancestry matters. That's the theme of our passage, our paragraph, which we begin in verse 39 in John chapter 8. In John chapter 8, Christ, as we have discussed, has been speaking to the crowds that have assembled around him during the Feast of Tabernacles. He has already begun a discourse with them, and back in verse 31, Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed in him, if you continue in my word, then you are truly my disciples, disciples of mine. And you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And this is when they, the pronoun they is operative here, who is they? Well, the context immediately would indicate it's the same group of people who have professed belief in Jesus Christ. I am personally of the opinion that the they also includes the spiritual leadership who harassed Jesus Christ all through his ministry primarily the scribes, Pharisees, and leaders of the Jewish temple. They were also included. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never yet been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? And Christ then goes on to talk to us about what true discipleship and true freedom means. And we looked at that last week. He concludes, in verse 38, I speak the things which I have seen with my father, therefore you also do the things which you heard from your father. He keeps referring to your father in reference to these Jews, but yet, as of yet in this passage, he has not revealed to them exactly the personage to whom he refers. He will in verse 44. So this next paragraph, which begins in verse 39, goes into the concept of true sonship. Verse 31 through 38 dealt with true discipleship, I believe, and verses 39 through 47, which we had read this morning, deal with true sonship or daughtership. 
if you will. Who is your spiritual father? We're going to walk through the passage briefly, and then we're going to make three applications. The applications are going to be formed through three specific questions for you. In verse 39, they answered him and said, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if Abraham, if you are Abraham's children, do the deeds of Abraham. All right, so he's presenting them with a conditional clause here. They claim kinship with Abraham and say that Abraham is our father. He's already acknowledged that Abraham is their physical father. They are descendants physically of Abraham. But he's going on to make a distinction. If you really are children of Abraham, then you have to do the things that Abraham did. So the title of this message is The Deeds of Your Father. Doing the deeds of your father is a primary means of knowing who your father really is. It's certainly a primary means of revealing your spiritual heritage. Children of God do the deeds of their father, who is God the Father. And children of the devil do the deeds of the devil, because he's their spiritual father. Verse 40, but as it is, you are seeking to kill me. Now, he's specifically talking about the Jews who have been plotting for some time since his Galilean ministry and all the way back to his first early ministry in the Gospel of John, which was in Judea and particularly Jerusalem. Since that time, there's been an ongoing plot to kill Jesus Christ. So he is saying logically here, if you are children of Abraham, why are you trying to kill me? A man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. I'm telling you what God has told me specifically. We've walked, at the, walked through this in previous passages that Jesus Christ says on innumerable occasions through the Gospels, I say that which God gave me to say. I don't speak on my own initiative. I tell you the truth, and the truth comes directly from God with whom I've had eternal fellowship. And he concludes that verse by saying, this Abraham did not do. Abraham didn't try to kill me. Abraham did not try to shut me up. Verse 41, you are doing the deeds of your father. Again, he's uh, using a very mysterious, almost hidden way of telling them, no, you really are acting like your father, but your father's not Abraham. And the frustration must be obvious on their faces. You are indeed acting like your daddy. They said to him, we are not born of fornication. We have one father, God. Now they're going to get very specific. Now this, we are not born of fornication, could be a sideswipe at Jesus Christ and his parentage. Perhaps the word had gone around that Jesus Christ was born illegitimately because Joseph and Mary were not married at the time of his conception. Perhaps they were calling into question his own uh, parental situation. They could also be calling into question, how can you say we're children of fornication? Because being a child of fornication was part and parcel with being an idolater. The old idolatrous systems of, of Canaan and places like that in which the lands in which Israel uh, as a nation inhabited, those people who were idolaters were idolaters in one particular way, and that was through physical sexual abuse and physical and sexual fornication. To be linked to fornication was to declare yourself an idolater. So they could be saying, we're not an idolatrous people, we know who we are. We're not born of fornication, and to prove it, we have one father, God. And God in the Old Testament did call himself the father of Israel. He did call himself the father of his people. But they still don't get what Jesus is saying, and they aren't asking the obvious question, who do you think our father is? Verse 42, Jesus said to them in a similar construction, if God were your father, in the same way that if Abraham were your father, if God were your father, you would love me, for I proceed forth and have come from God, for I have not even come on my own initiative, but he sent me. Two things here. If you are children of God, you're going to love me. Now that must have staggered these people right out of their sandals. Love you? We think you stink. We don't want anything to do with you. What you're saying is nonsense. They go on to say later on, you have a demon. You're a Samaritan. We're already calling into question your birth. Love you? 
And he says, yes, you must love me because I have proceeded from the Father. And this is where Jesus Christ begins to link himself with deity. He is essentially saying, through eternity past, I was with the Father, and the Father and I have concurred that I would come forth to save his people, and I have been sent by him. Now, verse 43, why do you not understand what I am saying? He asks rhetorically, Jesus, and the answer is, it is because you cannot hear my word. The second test we're going to talk about in a moment. Do you love Jesus Christ and do you listen to his word? Those are the tests of being true children of God according to this passage. But notice what he says, you cannot, you have no ability to hear my word. Then he gets specific. And what a denunciation in verse 44. All right, I'll finally tell you who your father is. You are of your father, the devil, Satan. And you want to do the desires of your father. You act like your father and you carry out your father's mission. And what was that father's mission? What were his primary characteristics? He was a murderer from the beginning. Don't just think in terms of Cain and Abel, the first murder we have. He brought murder and death and plunged the entire creation into chaos right from the start in the garden with Adam and Eve by telling them that great lie, you will not surely die. That brought death, and death has reigned since then. You're your father the devil. You carry out his desires, his lusts, he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in, have ab abiding in the truth because there is no truth in him. He has no truth at all apart, as part of his being or his character. And notice this, whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, his own things. One translation puts it this way, when he speaks a lie, he speaks his native language his native tongue. Most of us in here speak English, an American form of English. Many of us speak a southern form of American English. All right, that's fine. The point of it is that's our native tongue. That's how we speak. But get this, Satan's native tongue is a lie. His language is lies. Everything about him is a lie. There is no truth in him. Now get this condemnation. You are acting like your dad, Israel, this group of Israelis anyway. You're acting like your father because you want to kill me and because you are lying. Now notice this. He was a murderer from the beginning and did not stand in the truth. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature. For he is a liar and the father of lies. He is the father of all lying. And when we talk about something being the father of lies, we talked about this last week. When you say somebody is a son of disobedience, you're meaning that they act like their father who is disobedience. They're carrying out the characteristics of disobedience. This tells us that lying, falsehood, anything that is not true, and all that is contrary to God is part and parcel with Satan himself because he's the father of it. But notice verse 45. But because I speak the truth, you do not believe me. Now think about this condemnation here, how specific this is. He's not saying, even though I speak the truth, you don't believe me. He's saying, on the basis of speaking the truth, you don't believe me. He is tying them into Satan in whom there is no truth. Because I speak truth, you don't believe me. It's not because it isn't logical to you. It's not because it doesn't make sense. It's because you are part of the kingdom of Satan in the sense that you only know lies. And you say, well, this is, is this just some kind of an anti-Semitic tirade you've got here against Jewish people? Folks, this is mankind. We have all believed a lie and we're damned apart from the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice this. Which one of you convicts me of sin? You accuse me of sin. 
The word convicts there has a de- the idea of a, a legal standing. Which of you can go to a court of law and bring forth evidence that I indeed sin? This is a great declaration of the sinlessness of Christ. If I speak the truth, why do you not believe me? He's already stated, you can't believe me. Verse 48, the Jews answered and said to him, do we not say rightly you are a Samaritan and have a demon? You know, when you can't understand a man's arguments and all is not lost, you can still call him vile names. You know, it's like ad hominem is the name we use for this in a formal, logical way. I don't have anything to say to you, so I'll just call you a Samaritan. The point is, we are pure in our race. We are absolutely assured of our heritage. We know who we are as a people. We don't know who you are. You might even be a Samaritan. Verse 49, Jesus answered, I do not have a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. Three questions. They're pretty simple. Question number one and question number two are vitally linked. Question one, are you a child of Abraham? Now, there may be people here who have Jewish heritage. I don't know. Some of us may unknowingly have Jewish heritage. That's not the question. The question is, are you a spiritual child of Abraham as the scriptures reveal it? Physical descendancy from Abraham, being a Jew, has great advantages. Paul makes this very clear in Romans chapter 9. The first five verses say this, I'm telling the truth in Christ, I am not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. Why? For I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Paul says, I know I am a Jew, and I love my Jewish heritage so much that he's speaking the truth before God and saying, if I could see Israel saved, I would be willing to sacrifice myself spiritually and spend eternity in hell if it meant the Jews being saved. That's how important the Jews were to Paul. But he goes on to say, who are Israelites to whom belong the adoption of sons, the glory and the covenants, the giving of the law, and the temple service and the promises? Whose are the fathers from whom is Christ according to the flesh? who is over all, God bless forever, amen. So is there any advantage to being a Jew? Paul says, absolutely. You have the covenants, you have the law, and Jesus Christ is a descendant of Abraham himself. So when we have this discourse in John 8, it is a Jew talking to Jews. So there is advantage, physically in a sense, to be a descendant of Abraham. That's why in Romans 11, Verses 25 and 26a, Paul goes on to say, For I do not want you, to, you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation, that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come, and so all Israel will be saved. Now, I'm of the uh, persuasion, based on Romans 9, 10, and 11, that God has not closed the door on ethnic Israel. I fully believe that God is going to restore them as an ethnic people, and according to this passage, God is going to keep his Old Testament promise, and he is going to save them in a day. All right? So there's great advantage to being a descendant of Israel physically, but for most of us who are not descendants of Israel, we have an even greater advantage, and that is we are the spiritual descendants of Abraham. We are the spiritual seed of Abraham. We are his children on the basis of faith. Now, we have two major traits, faith and faithfulness that make us children of Abraham. Let's talk about faith. In Romans chapter 2, 28 and 29, Paul is bringing the entire world under condemnation. In chapter 1, it's general. In chapter 2, he focuses specifically on the Jews. And in verses 28 and 29 of chapter 2, he says, For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly. 
and circumcision is that which is of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the letter, and his praise is not from men, but from God. You are a spiritual descendant of Abraham by faith. When you are a believer in Jesus Christ, and when you have trusted God for your salvation in Christ completely on the basis of faith, you now become the seed of Abraham, the father of the faithful. Galatians chapter 3, verses 6 through 9, even so Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. That, ta- that phrase occurs throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. Abraham believed God, took God at his word, and it was accounted to him as righteousness. This is the doctrine of justification. Verse 7, therefore be sure that it is those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. The scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham. What did he say? All the nations will be blessed in you. So then those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham the believer. Praise to his name, you are our spiritual descendant of Abraham. You can say with Jesus Christ, I am a child of Abraham. James chapter 2. Someone's going to say this, James says. They may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works. And I will show you my faith by my works, says James. Now, is James speaking contrary to Paul? I don't think so. Verse 19 of James 2. You believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Then he goes to use the example of Abraham. All the writers in Scripture tend to use Abraham. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar? Whoa, 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 James, what are you saying? Paul just said it's not by works, it's by faith. James says we're justified by works. What does he mean? He means that the works of righteousness that Abraham performed, primarily offering up his son Isaac on the altar, demonstrated, validated his faith. It was now a faith at work. You see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected, made complete. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, and Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Now, folks, we have to understand two things. The first we've talked about. You're a child of Abraham if you believe in Jesus Christ by faith, and you do the works of Abraham through faithfulness. What did Jesus Christ say in this passage? Abraham didn't treat me the way you're treating me. Well, how did Abraham treat Christ? When would Abraham possibly have treated Christ in any way? The answer to that lies, I believe, primarily in Genesis chapter 18. Homework, go home and read Genesis 18. So you've got Abraham, and you've got Sarah there, and you have these three visitors. Lot has already gone to Sodom. These three visitors come, and Abraham begins to act in an amazing way. He begins to show incredible deference to them. He slays this calf and feeds them this massive meal. He treats them as royalty, so to speak. He does homage to them. And we find out that two of them are sent on to Sodom, and one remains, and Abraham then has fellowship with him. And this is nothing other than a Christophany. This is Jesus Christ, pre-incarnate, coming and visiting with Abraham. So Abraham really did see his day and was glad, as we see later on in this passage. And when Abraham was greeted by Jesus Christ, even in the flesh, so to speak, he didn't behave as these Jews did. He didn't try to kill him. He served him. So connecting these two, as James does, what do we see about Abraham, the father of the faithful? Well, Abraham welcomed Christ. Abraham worshipped Christ. Abraham worked for Christ, in a sense. And Abraham witnessed for Christ. We have a very interesting phrase in Genesis chapter 12, right at the beginning of the narrative about Abraham. 
as he gets into the land in the early days of his departure there, then he proceeded from there to the mountain on the east of Bethel. And he pitched, Abraham pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And the word called upon there is not just a term for prayer, it's a term for proclamation. So Abraham comes out in the middle of nowhere, he pitches this tent between Ai and Bethel, and he erects an altar, and then essentially he starts preaching the gospel. He starts telling people, this is Yahweh, this is God. And Abraham walked with Christ, he fellowshiped with him. And the scripture tells us he waited on him. These are the works of righteousness. Question number one, are you a child of Abraham spiritually? Are you of the faithful? And are you the ones who work in faithfulness? But a more important question, in a sense, comes up next. Are you a child of God? The Jews claim to be children of Abraham and to be a children of God. And Christ puts them to two tests. Test number one, do you love Christ? Test number two, do you listen to Christ? Those are the tests of whether or not you can call yourself legitimately a child of God according to Jesus Christ himself. Well, let's ask ourselves that question. Number one, do you love Jesus Christ? I want you to think about the person in this world that you love more than anybody else in the world. You love this person more than any other human being. For me, it's easy. She's sitting in the room. Do you think about Jesus Christ in any way that even approximates that? Does he captivate your attention? Does he dominate your thought life? Do you seek to do anything you can to bring him pleasure? And I love my wife more than I love anybody in the world, but the scripture indicates very clearly that even that kind of love in comparison to love for Christ should appear as hatred. That's how much you're supposed to love the Lord Jesus Christ. And you say, well, what drives you to love the Lord Jesus Christ that way? What did Jesus Christ do for you? Jesus Christ saved your eternal soul. Jesus Christ rescued you from the kingdom of darkness. He translated you into the kingdom of God's dear Son. He's made you a new creation in Christ Jesus. He's given you absolute eternal purpose for life. He's redeemed you. He's regenerated you. He's bought you back from the marketplace of sin. He's adopted you into his family. He's made you an heir and joint heir. And he's going to present you faultless before the throne of God with exceeding joy. He's doing everything possible to conform you to his image. Do you love this one more than anything? Bishop J.C. Ryle says, we are taught For another thing, the true marks of spiritual sonship. Our Lord makes this point most plain by two mighty sayings. Did the Jews say, we have Abraham to our father? He replies, if you were Abraham's children, he would do the work of Abraham. Did the Jews say, we have one father, even God? He replies, if God were your father, you would love me. Let those two sayings of Christ sink down into our hearts. The supply of They supply an answer to two of the most mischievous yet most common errors of the present day. What more common on one side than vague talk about the universal fatherhood of God? All men, we are told, are God's children, whatever their creed or religion. All are finally to have a place in the Father's house where there are many mansions. What more common on the other side than high-sounding statements about the effect of baptism and the privileges of church membership. Statements like these can never be reconciled with the plain language of our Lord in this passage. 
If words mean anything, no man is really a child of God who does not love Jesus Christ. The charitable judgment of a baptismal service or the hopeful estimate of a catechism may call him by the name of son and reckon him among God's children, but the reality of sonship to God and all its blessings no one possesses who does not love the Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Do you love Jesus? Test number two. Do you listen to Jesus? And this listening is more than just paying attention to what he's saying. It is listening with the ear focused toward obedience. It is listening to learn so that we might change. It is listening to learn so that we might grow and develop. You know, John 7, verses 16 and 17 give us this propensity. We talked about that a number of weeks ago. So Jesus answered them and said, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone is willing to do his will, he will know of the teaching, whether it is of God or whether I speak for myself. If you're willing to listen and act upon it, you'll have knowledge. You will know what the will of God is. And obedience, especially by loving his people. Now go back to 1 John, the same author as we have of our gospel, and go back to James. And what, what uh, type of illustration do they use as tests of whether or not you love Christ? Well, both do this. They say, what is your attitude toward and your actions for those who are Christ's? If any man sees somebody who's in distress and says to him, hey, be warm and filled, and you go your way, and you don't do anything for him, how dwells the love of God in you, John? Ask that same question. If you see your brother in need and don't do anything for him, how do you say, I have the love of God? The answer to both questions is, you don't have the love of God. How do I know you don't have the love of God? Because you don't love God's people. And you don't care for God's people. Those are tests, folks. Obedience. It leads to a third question. Are you a child of the devil? You say, wow. That's kind of pointed. Well, it's pointed, but it's a grace-based question. Are you a child of the devil? You know, people don't believe in Satan anymore. There was a, a Barna survey that indicated two-thirds of Americans don't really believe that the devil exists. And they don't think he's a living being. They might believe he's a symbol of evil, but 62% agreed with the statement that he is not truly a living being. This one writer asked, if less than one in three Americans seems willing to give the devil his due, from the New York Times, then that is a result of fundamental long-term shifts in the nation's religious culture. A test of our culture is we don't believe in Satan, let alone believe in God. How do you know if you're a child of Satan? Jesus gives us two tests for that as well. What does he say about Satan? He says he was a murderer and he was a liar. Death and deception. But what did Christ come to do? Hebrews 2. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself, Christ, likewise also partook of the same that through death he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. Devil has the power of death currently. He dwells in the realm of death, and those who do not know Jesus Christ are dead people walking, and they're also prone to murder. You say, well, you haven't thought about killing anybody. Well, really? Jesus Christ declares hatred is the same as killing. Hatred is the same as murder. And Satan has caused a creation of chaos that dwells in a death pit of deception as well as a death pit of murder. The world is prone toward hatred, anger, jealousy, revenge. Those are all part and parcel with Satan being that demon who has the power of death. The other is deception or lies. 
If Satan is your father, you dwell in the realm of death and you dwell in the realm of deception. Spiritual parentage is something so fundamental. How do you change it? It is so fundamental that it cannot be a reformation process. It cannot be a turning over of a new leaf. It cannot be a new discovery about yourself. Spiritual parentage is so important and so fundamental to who you are, it can only be changed by a rebirth. You have to be born again, as Christ told Nicodemus. The only solution to this problem, the only way to become a child of God and no longer a child of Satan, is to trust Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You have to have a spiritual renewal. You have to have that entire DNA package spiritually eradicated and replaced. You have to become a new creation in Christ Jesus. And then you have new spiritual parentage. And that parentage is God himself. So, who is your daddy? Who's your father? Are you still living in the household of Satan? Or like Abraham and those of his spiritual seed, is God your father? I love the old hymn written in the 1600s. My, love, my song is love unknown, my Savior's love to me. Love to the loveless shown, that they might lovely be. Oh, who am I that for my sake my Lord should take frail flesh and die? And that bears out the truth that we love him because he first loved us. Let's pray. It's my sincere prayer, Father, that if someone in the building doesn't know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, that that someone might come to know him aright and therefore know life eternal. And I pray that people would be translated from one family to another through spiritual rebirth and that we might be called the sons and daughters of God because of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Only you can change our spiritual DNA. Only you can make us new creations in Christ Jesus. We pray that you would do so in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.